Hi, I'm John Stevenson. We're going to be looking at Hezekiah and Babylon in 2 Kings chapter 20, verses 12 through 22. Just a summary of where we've been. We, we began back in chapter 18 that gave us a brief summary of Hezekiah's reign. And then we had that story that opened up as with the invasion of of the Assyrians into Judah. So these emissaries and troops had arrived and taken over a good portion of the land, had taken a number of cities. Uh, they then come to Hezekiah and to Jerusalem with a threatening message, and Hezekiah does not allow them into the city. <laughs> and uh, when they threaten him, he actually t- he, he, he is afraid, but he also takes their letter before the presence of God And Isaiah reassures him that the Assyrians will not destroy the city of Jerusalem, that God will intervene. And sure enough, he prays for deliverance. And that prayer is answered as 185,000 of the Assyrians die in one night. And uh, uh, Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, is forced to pack up and go home. And that's the end of that that narrative, as well as that chapter. The next chapter begins, what we looked at last time, was chapter 20, verses 1 through 11. Not necessarily in chronological order, but I think it is in topical order. So uh, this scene is where Hezekiah prays for deliverance, just like previously he prayed for the deliverance of of Jerusalem against the Assyrians. This time he prays for deliverance as it is announced to him that he's about to die. Uh, And he's sick unto death, and God answers his prayer, And he's told that he's going to live for another 15 years. And he's given a sign, a sign of the shadow moving. (laughs) And it's actually moving in the opposite direction to which shadows normally move throughout the day. Now we come to chapter 20 and verse 12. And again, just like we'd seen before, there are, there's an arrival of emissaries from the east. But this time, instead of being hostile, this time they are friendly. Before they were from Assyria, now they're from Babylon and the Babylonian king. Uh, a a king who's actually fighting against the Assyrians, and that is Merodach Baladan. We'll look at him in just a moment. They're going to come with a message. Uh, They'll be giving, instead of a threatening message, it will be a message with gifts of peace and, and trying to build up an alliance. Hezekiah does allow them into the city, actually welcomes them, trust them, whether he should or not. He he actually brings them and shows them his palace, and he shows them the temple and gives them a guided tour of the city. And Isaiah then comes, and instead of reassuring uh, Hezekiah, he's going, to give them a, he's going to give them a rebuke and a warning that one day the Babylonians will come back and they will destroy Jerusalem. And so notice that this story is, in a sense, in some ways, the polar opposite of the section of the story that we saw back in chapters 18 and 19. And then as we come to an end, we'll have a couple of verses at the end giving a summary of Hezekiah's reign uh, in a similar way to which the uh, that formula began back in chapter 18. So this is going to um, serve as bookends to the entire story of Hezekiah. Chapter 20 and verse 12, at that time, Barodak Baladan, now, uh, when we see that name, uh, Barodak Baladan, some manuscripts render this Merodak Baladan. Notice the, the, the only difference is that opening letter, uh, whether it's a B or an M. And there's a parallel passage where this same story is told almost word for word in Isaiah chapter 39. And there it has, instead of Barodak, it has Merodak. Uh, and notice he's called uh, Barodak Baladan. Uh, a son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he'd heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Now, that's referencing the previous verses that we've just read. And so we have this idea. He's been sick, and he's been healed. And so Second uh, Kings chapter 20, verses 1 through 11, take place prior to 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 12 and following. Now you say, well, isn't that obvious? Well, perhaps not, because we already noted that the earlier narrative actually might have taken place later, that the story of Hezekiah is not necessarily given in chronological order. Rather, it's a topical order, and that's why we were just looking at the at the way that this, the entire narrative balances out. It might have actually been 
put in that order so that it would balance out and so that it would fit that, uh, that perfect scheme. Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31, this is the parallel passage that talks about this visit. And notice it says, even in the matter of the envoys of the rulers of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire uh, uh, of the wonder that had happened in the land, God left him alone only to test him that he might know what was in his heart. And so uh, when Chronicles comments on this, notice uh, it's it's actually uh, referring to the same visit, but it says that this was a test. This was a test that God was bringing about to test Hezekiah to see what was in his heart. And we're going to see that, at least in a sense, a portion of this test is going to meet with failure. Now, Merodach, or Barodach, however we want to uh, pronounce his name, uh, his name means Marduk, that's the Merodach part. Marduk has given a son. Uh, He's also known in Babylonian writings uh, as Marduk, uh, Apla Edina, and uh, but we're, I'm going to re- just refer to him as either Burodak or Morodak Baladan, as is here in this passage. Uh, he had taken the throne of Babylon back when Sargon II first became king. If you remember, that was when uh, Shalmaneser V was was uh, at uh, Samaria. He was besieging Samaria in a two to three year siege. And near the end of that time, um, Shalmaneser died. And was he killed? The circumstances are a bit unknown to us. And Sargon II became king. Uh, and in the, we've actually got an inscription where Sargon says, yes, I was the, the younger brother of uh, Shalmaneser V. Um, he, he wasn't known as Sargon before this. He takes the name. And the name that he takes, frankly, has mystified a number of scholars because if you remember that there was a, a Sargon the Great way back in early Mesopotamian history, and even his name was suspicious because Sargon uh, literally means legitimate Sar. Sar is a word for prince, so legitimate prince. And you wonder why somebody would take that name if they were really legitimate. Maybe, maybe he protested a bit too much. So, so actually, some scholars have wondered, was he making that up when he said he was the brother of uh, of uh, Shalmaneser V. Uh, but in any case, uh, in that confusion of, of one king dying and another king, not even his son, but his brother, at least reputed brother, taking his place, in that confusion, Merodach Baladan stepped in. Merodach Baladan stepped in and he took the throne of Babylon, uh, allying himself with the enemy of Assyria, that is the country of Elam to the uh, east and southeast of Mesopotamia. So he he formed this alliance. And for the next 10 years, he ruled Babylon and the people of Babylon were okay with that. Uh, In fact, uh, it seems to have been a a relative area, uh, arena of peace, even though um, Sargon, you know, Sargon had other issues on his plate, but he, he eventually came and tried to drive out um, uh, drive out Merodach Baladan, and finally did succeed in that. Uh, he was eventually driven from Babylon by Sargon II. Um, and yet when Sargon II died, and when Sargon II died, he was actually fighting um, peoples in central Anatolia, the, the former location of the, the old Hittite empire. Uh, and he di- Sargon II died in battle, which was considered extraordinarily bad luck to the Assyrians, uh, so bad that uh, in, their, in their mythology, if you die on the battlefield and your body isn't brought back, and it wasn't, they, they lost his body, um, then it was like you weren't really going to, to make it into the afterlife and you were going to be a, a, a pauper and a wanderer. And the Assyrians looked at that as a very terrible omen. Uh, so uh, in that confusion, <laughs> Merodak Baladan comes back to Babylon uh, and uh, he's going to be, he's not going to stay. Sennacherib, the same Sennacherib who is, uh, comes against uh, Judah and against Hezekiah, dry, is going to drive uh, uh, Merodach Bala down from Babylon a second time. Um, and this time he'll, he'll set up residence in Elam and uh, Sargon will actually, uh, not Sargon, Sennacherib 
will follow him down there and fight a battle. And, uh, both sides claim the victory on that. So it sounds a little bit like sort of a stalemate. Uh, and Merodach Baladan will spend the rest of his days there in Elam. Uh, so it sounds like this story is taking place um, perhaps in that time when Merodach Baladan is in his tenure period in Babylon. That sounds like when that's taking place. So like I said, it's probably not, uh, or all of our stories of Hezekiah properly are not in chronological order. And and Merodach Baladan is sending envoys to Jerusalem, to Hezekiah, to drum up support. Let's all revolt against Assyria. And that's not going to turn out too well for either of those kings. Verse 13, Hezekiah listened to them, that is these envoys, and showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasuries. Now the fact that there's a lot in his treasuries again hints to us that the Assyrians haven't yet come and taken that all away. Because remember, um, when the Assyrians do come, Hezekiah is going to try the, to buy them off by stripping all of his riches, even the gold off of the, the temple and things from his palace, and he's going to hand all that over. Well, here it doesn't sound like he's handed it over yet. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. It looks like, well, frankly, it looks like he's showing off. Now, is he showing off to show them the glory of God, how great God is? Or is he showing off maybe a little bit of that, showing off how great he is? And, and of course, he might be trying to do a little bit of both. I, I want to be fair to Hezekiah. Verse 16, then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried. Now, it doesn't say it's going to be carried to Assyria, but will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left. Um, you know, there, after, when the Assyrians come, there's going to be lots that's taken away. But there's going to be some things that are left. But Isaiah says, there's coming a day when nothing will be left, says the Lord. Some of your sons who shall issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away. And they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Babylon, here they're trying to court you. They're trying to find favor. They're going to be the enemy of your kingdom. Verse 19, then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, and, and his, his response is interesting. First of all, he says, the word of the Lord, which you have spoken, is good. And you say, well, okay, well, uh, that was actually bad news, but, but there, apparently there's some good in there. For he thought, and here's what he's thinking, is it not so if there will be peace and truth in my days? And, and you can take that a couple of different ways. You can take it, well, yes, there's judgment coming, but but hey, we're at peace now, so I'm not going to have to see that. But but again, I want to be fair to Hezekiah, and I, it might be that he's saying, look, it's good that, yes, some bad things are going to happen. The judgment of God is going to happen. But in the meantime, we can enjoy today, and we can give today to the Lord, because today he has given us this day where we can worship him, we can be faithful to him, we can seek his face, and We'll see what happens tomorrow. Uh, remember that prophecies, prophecies of the future are oftentimes conditional. And, uh, and so it might be that he's saying, look, um, it might be that those, that judgment, just like we saw the, the, the words of, of Hezekiah's death did not immediately come to pass, even though they were going to, because of his prayer, because prophecies are sometimes conditional. And so here again, is it not so if there will be peace and truth in my days, perhaps as long as I'm faithful, that that judgment will be withheld? And indeed, that's exactly what... Now, now in verse 20, we see the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might and how he made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city. And we talked about this in an earlier class, Hezekiah's tunnel. And you can go through, if you ever go to Jerusalem, you want to walk through Hezekiah's tunnel, this, this long tunnel. Uh, in the picture, it looks like it's all lit up. Actually, that's just the flash from the camera. We're standing in almost total darkness. We had a couple little, little tiny hand flashlights uh, that were just barely enough to see where we were walking. 
Uh, but walked through Hezekiah's tunnel where he uh, dug this tunnel and brought water into the city, that is, into the city of Jerusalem. And notice, are these stories not all written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Verse 21, so Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and Manasseh, his son, became king in his place. Now, we saw back in chapter 20, verses 1 through 11, Hezekiah's walk by faith. Remember, we're we're being given this promise that he was about to die, that Hezekiah turned to God. And in turning to God and praying to the Lord, he received 15 more years of life. And yet here, there's a walk that, at least at the beginning of it, is a walk by sight. These envoys from Babylon come, and Hezekiah looks like he's showing off a bit. He he turns to this pagan king. And as a result, he's warned of the future captivity. And I like to think that he repented and and said, well, okay, well, we're going to be faithful in the interim. Uh, But at least initially, there's, there's a bit of this walk by sight. And notice when Hezekiah dies, his son Manasseh becomes king in his place. And we'll look next at the story of Manasseh, and it won't be a good story. You see, as we come to the story of Manasseh, who actually we most scholars believe that he was co-regent with Hezekiah for for those last maybe those last fifteen years, for at least for a number of years, uh, but Manasseh is going to turn in the other direction instead of being faithful. Manasseh is going to be the one of the worst kings that the kingdom of Judah ever sees in its entire history. He's going to start off very bad. In fact, tradition has it that he will put Isaiah to death. And yet, as bad as a beginning as he has, at the end, at the end, we're going to see at least a measure of repentance on the part of Manasseh. But we'll look at that next time.